Good afternoon, uh, good morning uh, everyone, depending on where you are. Uh, uh, a very warm welcome and thank you for joining this second discussion in the Land Dialogue webinar series, organized in partnership with the Ford Foundation, the Land Portal Foundation, the Tenure Facility and the Thomson Reuters Foundation. Uh, this initiative promotes the importance of recognizing legal ownership of indigenous peoples and local communities land rights as a prerequisite for achieving national and international goals for forest governance, food security, climate mitigation, economic development and human rights. This land dialogue series will run once a month until October with each webinar tackling a different topic. I'm Jonathan Watts, hello. Uh, I'm Global Environment Editor at The Guardian, and I'm delighted to be your host today. We have a fantastic panel who, will I, who I will introduce you to shortly, but first some housekeeping. This webinar will take place mainly in English and will be simultaneously interpreted to Spanish, French and Portuguese. To access the interpretation, please see the channels located at the bottom of your screen. You'll see a little globe with interpretation. Click on that and choose the language uh, of your choice. We'll have, open, we'll have a, an introduction and a discussion for about an hour. And then finally, we'll take questions from the audience, uh, which should take us to about 90 minutes in total. If you have questions, you can start thinking of them and posting them right now using the Q&A button, which is also at the bottom of your screen. Uh, please choose that rather than the chat box on the right hand side. Um, and then those questions will be fielded to the panelists in the last 30 minutes. Um, feel free to tweet about this event using hashtag biodiversity day and hashtag land dialogues. Um, and you can follow live tweeting from Lamb Portal and Tenure Facility Twitter accounts as well. I should add that today's session is being recorded and you will receive the link afterwards. To begin with, um, I'd like to get to know a little bit more about you in the audience. We've had a fantastic response. 800 people have signed up for this webinar and that shows just how many people are interested in the topic, uh, which is how can indigenous people help prevent future pandemics? Um, sadly, we cannot see and talk to each other, um, but let's find out a bit more about everyone who's out there with uh, a few very short polls. So uh, please join in. On the right-hand side of your screen, you should see a, uh, a, a place that says, uh, poll. Can you see that on my screen? I yes, it should have come up there. There you go. It's come up on the screen. First question. Uh, please choose one of the following. Uh, we want to find out where you're from. What region are you joining us from? So choose from one of these five boxes. Just click on. Uh, is it five, six boxes? Uh, click on the one that is appropriate for you. Which region are you joining us from? Uh, I'll just give you a few more seconds to choose that one. And then we'll just close that. Has everyone got that? I hope that everyone's got that. Please choose which region. And okay, we'll close that poll. And now let's see the results. They should appear on the screen very shortly. I don't see them right now. Hopefully they'll come up any second or someone will point them out to me. Um, yes, there we go. Okay, so um, good. We've got a, quite a strong international spread. Sadly, not, in, not many in Africa or Oceania, but um, half the people from Europe, 29% uh, from North America, 14% from Latin America and the Caribbean, and 14 from Asia. So very international, which is great. Uh, now, uh, next question, there'll be three of these questions, so just, just to know who you are. What sector, question, the next poll question, what sector do you work in? 
what sector do you work in? Let's see which of those. There should be a choice coming up of government, NGO, and so forth. Um, should appear on your screen very shortly. Here we go. Oh no, that's the first, <laughs> that's the first webinar poll back up with us. Sorry for the slight technical hitches here. Can we go to the second question, please? Uh, we still have that first question there. Let's see. No, it's still the first question. Um, I'm, let's see what is happening. Um, no, it seems like we're having a few technical hitches there. Well, let's not get bogged down with that. Um, what I will suggest is that we move on um, and uh, uh, I'll, just <laughs> I'll just assume uh, we'll, we'll stick with knowledge about where you're all from for now. Um, this pandemic has shown us very clearly how the imbalance in ecosystems is driven by human activities. Um, we've learned from studies and grim experience that outbreaks of infectious disease are more likely in areas of deforestation and monoculture plantations. We've learned that biodiversity is the best buffer against the spread of zoonotic pathogens. Um, to put this, today's discussion in context, um, I'd just like to look at some numbers. Some people argue against land rights and environmental protection on economic grounds, the saying that it will hurt livelihoods, that it will hurt GDP if we protect um, uh, indigenous land and, and areas of rich biodiversity. Well, let's turn that around. Let's look at the cost of not protecting communities and nature. Let's look at the cost of this pandemic, for example. However you calculate it, uh, COVID-19 has, has taken a horrific tally. We have 3.4 million dead so far, many more hospitalized or suffer suffering long COVID. The economic cost is enormous. The International Monetary Fund has warned that the final bill for the pandemic could total $28 trillion. The IMF has also estimated that 95 million people may have entered extreme poverty and 80 million uh, more people are undernourished compared to pre-pandemic levels. So people can always ask, can we really afford to do this? But that is the wrong question. What we need to be asking is, can we afford not to do this? Especially when you look on the other side of the equation, the equation, what might be the cheapest and most effective remedy? Countless studies have shown that support for indigenous and traditional community land rights is the most cost effective way to protect forests, store carbon and maintain biodiversity. To this, can we now add that it's one of the most cost effective ways to pre pre prevent or reduce the risk of future disease outbreaks and pandemics? That's one of the questions we're asking today. What is the role of indigenous people in this crisis and local communities in this crisis? How can protection of their land rights help to protect all of us? How can they move to the forefront of decision-making? Um, to kick things off, we will now have an introductory video from Dr. David Navarro. Uh, Dr. Navarro is a special envoy on COVID-19 for the World Health Organization. He's made his career in the international civil service, working for at one time the Secretary General of the United Nations, also the Director General of the World Health Organization. Um, since February 2020, he has helped the WHO uh, WHO deal with the pandemic. This should, this video by him, video introduction by him, should now appear on your screens. How do you do? I'm really pleased to have an opportunity to link up with you today to talk about One Health land rights and pandemics. 
My name is David Navarro, and I've been working in this area since 2000, 2002, really. And uh, I wanted to share with you really three thoughts. The first one is about equity. The pandemic caused by COVID-19, it really is hitting poor people much harder than anybody else. This is partly due to the direct impact of the virus because poorer people are much less easily able to protect themselves from infection. But it's also to do with the consequences of essential containment measures. These tend to hit poor people the worst. And unless there's a great deal of care to try to ensure that the interests of poor people are properly protected, then they will suffer and that suffering may not be reduced through response measures. So I'm saying we should do everything possible to encourage equity, because this in turn reduces the threat associated with the current pandemic and pandemics to come. And I actually think that we really need to recognize that land rights are key to improving the position of poorer people. And that if we really are going to respond to their needs, we have to also be advocating for land rights as well. The second point, I want to focus on biodiversity. Pandemics are commonly caused by newly emerging pathogens, that's new viruses or bacteria. And in 75% of cases, they spill over from the animal kingdom. And land rights for indigenous people and local communities, they protect biodiversity and they reduce the risk of zoonoses. So that means that by encouraging land rights, we are both promoting biodiversity and also protecting health. My third point is to actually encourage you to really commit to One Health. This is something I've been working on since 2005, when I first was brought into the effort to tackle bird flu. When we're trying to reduce the risk of disease, particularly diseases that spill over from animals to humans, we need to be able to focus on the interfaces between animal health, human health, plant health and environmental health. And we will only focus on the interfaces if we have a unified health discipline. And that's what One Health is. We need to be sure that we follow the One Health approach to the full when we are preventing and then responding to disease outbreaks. And indeed, I would like to encourage the application of One Health much more widely because in the end that is key to empowering everybody in response to pandemics. So in summary, land rights, particularly for poor, poorer people, are absolutely key both to dealing with the inequities associated with pandemics and also reducing the risk of zoonotic disease. And the One Health approach is the approach that I would commend to you all. So thank you again for giving me the chance to connect. I wish you well with the event. Great. Um, how wonderful to have um, uh, a, such an influential voice to get things started. Um, uh, David Navarro there with very important uh, uh, advocacy of this uh, One Health, One World uh, idea. Now, um, we will now move in uh, to, to meet our panel. Um, we have a superb lineup of so experts in, in their fields and areas. Um, I'll briefly introduce them and then we'll get into the, the, the discussion. First up, we have uh, uh, Georgi Carino, who has been an active campaigner and advocate over the past 35 years on indigenous people's human rights at a community, national and international level. Uh, she's the senior policy advisor and former director of the Forest Peoples Programme. 
Uh, she's an environment and development educator and researcher with expertise on indigenous knowledge and traditional occupations, cultural and bio biological diversity, international standards on forest, water and energy, extractive industries and corporate accountability. Uh, hi, Joji. Uh, next up, uh, Carlos. Hi, Carlos. Carlos Zambrana Torello, Torello apologies, is the Associated Vice President for Conservation and Health at the Eco Health Alliance. Uh, Dr. Zambrana Torello works on the intersection between animal and human health. He is particularly interested in how biological diversity from viruses to ecosystems respond to anthropogenic gradients. Um, in other words, the transition from city to forest and how the risk levels increase between the two. Carlos combines quantitative methods from different fields, including biodiversity, economics, and spatial analysis in his research. Next up, uh, we have Eric, Eric Fevri. Uh, hi, Eric, who is a joint appointee at the International Livestock Research Institute in Kenya and a professor of veterinary infectious diseases at the Institute of Infection, Veterinary and Ecological Sciences at the University of Liverpool. He's an epidemiologist specialized in the area of zoonotic diseases. That is diseases that can transmit between animals and people and how they emerge, spread and cause ill health in humans and animals. Uh, his team's work is very interdisciplinary, involving biology, medicine, veterinary medicine, but also ecology and anthropology, urban planet, planning, and socioeconomics. Uh, then uh, we have uh, very happy to welcome Fran Francis Francisco Piaco. Uh, hi, Francisco, who is the leader of the Asheninka people. Francisco was advisor and secretary of the State Government for Indigenous Peoples between 2003 and 2010. He then advised the presidency of the National Indian Foundation, FUNAI, in the administration of Marcio Meira during a moment of rapprochement uh, between the federal government and Indigenous peoples. In 2018, he was a candidate for federal deputy for Polo of Acre. After that, uh, the the Asheninka leader began to act with the indigenous movement and organization of his people outside of the government sphere. And last but by not at all least, um, very welcome uh, to Gladys Kalima Zikusoka. Hi Gladys, uh, who is a Ugandan veterinarian and founder of Conservation Through Public Health, an organization dedicated to the coexistence of endangered mountain gorillas, other wildlife, humans, and livestock in Africa. She was uh, Uganda's first wildlife veterinary officer and the star of the BBC documentary, Gladys, the African Vet. In 2009, she won the Whitley Gold Award for her conservation work. Uh, so uh, a lot of expertise there uh, over a wide area. So let's get into the discussion. Um, uh, remember, later we'll have Q&A, so please submit questions via the box below. But um, let's let's let, let's get into um, the, the 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 deep knowledge from our panelists. Um, I'd like to start with um, Eric. Um, Eric, maybe you could kind of build on what we heard from David Nabarro. Um, and tell us what is the One Health approach and what, oh, uh, uh, my apologies, um, Eric, could you first of all um, give us examples of diseases jumping from animals to humans that have not necessarily made the news until now? Yes, good, good afternoon, good morning, hello everybody. Uh, so absolutely, so-called zoonotic diseases which uh, move between humans and other animals are actually a, a big group of pathogens and there are many that uh, listeners today might not have heard of. I have a little list here, I'll just read them. Rift Valley Fever, Cystosicosis, Brucellosis, Echinococcus, Rabies, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, Coronavirus, Lyme Disease, E. coli, Salmonella, Campylobacter, 
bovine tuberculosis, hantavirus, Q fever, Congo hemorrhagic fever, uh, Kyasinur forest disease, sleeping sickness, the plague, uh, and many more. Um, there, there are many of these. In fact, more than um, more than a hundred more. Uh, and in fact, well over half of known human diseases are such diseases that that cross that boundary between uh, humans and non-human animals. Some rarely come into human populations, uh, and some are making that leap on a daily basis uh, and and causing what we might call a daily grind of, of infection in, in, in populations. And many of these diseases are, are termed by the World Health Organization as neglected diseases because we know little about them or little about how they spread. But uh, in the context of today's webinar, we might call them diseases of neglected populations. That is, they occur in groups of people who, who have little voice to, to express the, the importance of these, uh, the, the, the impacts of these diseases in, in their populations. And many are hiding away in animal hosts that we don't yet know about. So slowly evolving and, and going about their evolution and one day may find a way to jump into the human population. And I'm sure Carlos will, will tell us more his thoughts on, on that kind of thing shortly. And so for all of these diseases, we have to keep up a, a strong surveillance effort to, to understand where they're a problem, where they might be a problem, and how we can predict the problem that they they do cause or might cause in the future uh, with, with surveillance efforts going forward. Yeah. Sorry, Jonathan, I can't hear you. So uh, COVID yeah. is only a part of the story. Thank, thank you for making that clear. There's a lot of other neglected but important diseases out there. Um, and yeah, uh, it's going to happen again and again. Um, uh, on that that question that sort of suggests that we do need a, a, a really big holistic approach. So going back to that One Health uh, idea of David Nabarro, what is that? Could you elaborate a little bit? And what is its role, potential role as well in the COVID-19 pandemic? Sure. So traditionally or usually, we think of uh, health in different populations separately. We, we worry about humans and their health as a separate problem from say animals and their health or the, the health of the broader environment in which we all live. And, and One Health really tries to bring all of that back together into a, a more unified kind of paradigm. It's, it's really a concept that, that brings all of those, those elements of health back together and makes explicit that the, the boundary between humans and non-human animals is, is, ver is a very thin one. Um, and, and that, as I described, anim, uh, pathogens can move across that boundary uh, very easily indeed. And also that the environment that we as a species share with the multiple other species uh, in the world um, is, and the, the health of that environment is, is a key factor in, in describing how, the, how that, those healthy relationships uh, can be maintained and how pathogens might spread across uh, those different populations. One way I sometimes think about it is uh, a loaf of bread on the counter in your kitchen. If you cut that loaf of bread, you expose the inside of that loaf of bread and the, the moist environment of that bread, things will, that are in the air will land on it and mold might grow. And the, the interface between us and uh, us as humans and other species is a little bit like that. The, the, there's, there's a very delicate balance between our relationship with our environment and our relationship with other species. And if we mess around or play with or, or, or change the nature of the relationship in any way, we're increasing the opportunity for something interesting to happen at that interface. And, and really what One Health does is try and understand all of those different elements of, of, that come together at that interface to understand how something might happen, when it might happen, uh, and, and, and why. And with respect to, to, to COVID, uh, COVID was originally a disease in other animals, non-humans, and it evolved to be able to infect humans uh, and moved into the human population and has then spread very quickly. So COVID is now a human disease and we worry about it very much from a, a medicalized perspective, thinking about how one human contacts another human, how wearing a mask with other people stops the transmission of that virus. But originally 
it came from a different species and we, we missed it really we missed the that that jump event um and and it then spread and became became a big problem in the human population so one health allows us to to try and consider all of those things together and keep a focus on those interfaces where from my perspective as a biologist interesting things happen but from a public health point of view where we have to intervene to stop those kinds of things from happening and having a big effect thank you eric yes um those interesting things for you can be uh quite terrible for lots of other people of course um and I, I, i'm really struck by the idea that the duality that we often make between human and non-human between environment and and economy um is 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 a false one sometimes and we're much more interconnected um than 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 many people would make out so th thank you for that we'll, we'll continue those discussions shortly um uh, i'd like to move now to um joji um hi joji um indigenous peoples and local communities all over the world have been have, have disproportionately suffered during this pandemic um yet some people argue they might actually have the key to preventing future ones uh can you explain how indigenous peoples have dealt with epidemics in the past um, thanks, Jonathan, and uh, greetings to everyone. Um, here, for example, in the Philippines, we have customary rules to heal and restore uh, community health and resilience through rest days, community lockdowns, or seasonal restrictions on work and harvesting, and cultural taboos to protect sacred and important uh, cultural species. Rituals and the use of traditional medicines are important practices for healing and well being. Local and traditional foods are important contributions to the diet. And all these help to maintain the health of the community and our lands. So, in the Philippines, uh, key biodiversity areas overlap ancestral domains. And uh, ecosystems in a much better state are found mostly on indigenous lands and waters. So um, indigenous peoples actively defend our territories against land use change, agricultural intensification, wildlife trade, and harmful extractive projects. Illegal wildlife trade is rampant in the Philippines, undermining customary sustainable use practices amongst indigenous peoples who maintain respectful and reciprocal relationships with nature and other spirits around us. Under severe lockdown, states and businesses have aggressively stepped up extractive and energy projects and military operations affecting indigenous peoples. One example is the renewal of the Oceana gold mining operations in Nueva Vizcaya compromising the province's uh, watershed and agroforestry values. So this uh, copper and gold mining project is within the Magat watershed area, feeding the Magat River, the largest tributary of the Cagayan River, and traversing one of the few remaining primary forests in the Philippines. Local residents barricaded against the entry of the company in their lands, leading to violent dispersal and injury of several indigenous persons, mostly women. And this line of defense against development aggression is also a line of defense against disease and their spread. Land use changes and deforestation disrupt this uh, balance in relationships between nature and people. This is true in natural systems or in industrial food systems, which create conditions for animal pathogens and diseases to transfer to people. So um, I can see exactly how um, these uh, relationships are true in the Philippines. Thank you, Georgie. Um, it, it sounds that some, some fairly horrible things um, going on there, both, both for local communities and with potential spillovers um, far beyond. Um, looking more sort of on the on the on the positive side, um, 
It's been suggested, as I mentioned earlier, that that if indigenous people and local communities um, have stronger land rights, then that could be one of the most affordable options um, for, for preventing the kind of spillover conditions that Eric mentioned earlier from wildlife. And, uh, uh, could you uh, talk a little bit about the potential for doing that? Um, yes, as, um, as I was uh, mentioning earlier, uh, territorial governance and customary use by indigenous peoples have safeguarded much of the remaining biodiversity. So yes, it is affordable because it is carried out through the collective actions of community members, often without uh, direct financial contributions by the government. But this uh, guardianship remains precarious and land rights are not secure, despite the existence of the Indigenous Peoples' Rights Act in the Philippines. Implementing this law will require budgetary contributions for delineation, demarcation, and restoration of community lands and support for community self-determined development. Indigenous peoples have become impoverished by the current economic model. The government continues to promote mining, which is extracting local wells and causing destruction of ecosystems and communities, which requires very expensive remediation. The costs of uh, addressing biodiversity loss and climate change impacts are far more expensive than preventing these global problems. In much the same way that curing pandemics when they occur is much more expensive than preventing them, the incentives given to destructive projects far outweigh the meager financial support flowing to indigenous uh, communities for our vital contributions. So um, affordability may be one criterion for supporting indigenous people's land rights to protect nature and prevent pandemics. But uh, taking a broader view and other values into account, securing indigenous people's land rights is also one of the best ways to address systemic and structural inequalities, which are at the root of our planetary crisis. The um, weakness of an instrumental approach towards indigenous peoples, for example, just focusing on affordability, is that the full values of cultural diversity and our other contributions may be overlooked. For example, many indigenous peoples are prioritizing um, revitalization of indigenous food systems to address the current biodiversity and health crisis. So this nexus between food, ecology, health, and culture is at the heart of an indigenous food systems approach, which links the well-being of the planet to the well-being of people through sustainable and healthy diets. Indigenous homelands are rich in species and genetic diversity compared to surrounding lands. The full values of these lands are actually priceless contributions by our peoples. Thank you, Joji. Um, you put that very well. You wrapped all the different elements together. This is definitely not just about affordability, though unfortunately it seems affordability is, is one of the driving forces there's so much more to that. And in a way, the culture is, is wrapped into um, a, a more healthy relationship with nature. When we lose the culture, maybe we lose that relationship. So I think that's a really uh, Im important area uh, of, of discussion. Um, uh, I will now move, let's, let's, we've, we've heard from Indonesia and Southeast Asia. Let's, let's cross to cross the Pacific there um, and hear what's happening in, in on the ground in, in Brazil. Let's let's hear from uh, Francisco uh, on, I, I mean, obviously Brazil is one of the hotspots of the pandemic. Uh, 439,000 people have died in Brazil. A very high number of them, proportionate to the population, are indigenous, quilombola, or, or from riverine communities. Um, Francisco, Francisco, uh, Bon dia. Uh, can you please explain bon how? Dia. 
<laughs> Can you please explain how indigenous people in Brazil um, are, are, are coping in this situation? É um desafio muito grande. Né? Primeiro, bom dia a todos. É, quando né, no Brasil a gente tem um número muito alto. No Brasil, we have a very high death toll due to the pandemic. We actually surpassed 440,000 deaths. And this is very very, of course, a very important issue for us. And the co indigenous community has a very high to death toll as well. So us, the indigenous peoples from all over Brazil are going through a very hard situation. Not only we are faced with the pandemic, but also the lack of commitment by the state of a, having a proper strategy to protect protect the indigenous peoples. Therefore, internally within our communities, we have been discussing and working in order to protect ourselves. And we are using our traditional knowledge to do so. Uh, historically, we have gone through difficult times such as this. And it's not only pandemics. Uh, we have knowledge, we have traditional medicines that we extract from the forest. We have managed actually to save many lives do, thanks to traditional knowledge from our people. So our strategy is isolation. We are isolating and preventing contact. We are also working with our traditional medicine knowledge and medicines that we extract from the forest to protect ourselves. Uh, this is from the pages, the healers. They are acting and they are, and all our leaders are working very hard, but we did lose a few leaders during the process. Specifically, in the case of the Brazilian Amazon, we, it also coincides with a, a serious crisis in, in terms of deforestation rates. We have very high deforestation rates going on in the Amazon. This is frightening, really, especially when combined with the pandemic. So we are suffering an attack. Indigenous peoples are being, they are under attack from these two in, uh, spheres in a very violent manner. It is very clear to us, it is very clear to our people As you have mentioned here, it is very clear that when the forest is intact, is protected, and, and the indigenous peoples are in the forest, we are protected. But when you change our practices, our paths, our environment, then we become vulnerable. That's when we start getting worried and concerned. We are very concerned with the pandemic and with the protection of the forest. We fight for our land rights and for pro protection of the forest and biodiversity. These were important conquests uh, and victories we uh, achieved in the past, but they are now under threat because the state is not protecting, is not ensuring these rights are respected. And as they are written in the national constitution of Brazil. And this has had a huge impact on indigenous peoples. So when we see these attack to our, to our land rights and to the rights 
to our traditions and customs due to this external pressure, due to interests from businesses that really go over, literally go over our homes, we are threatened because the forest is our home. The rivers, the paths within the forest, this is our home. And we are really working hard to protect the, those because this is what promotes sustainability in the world. And this is the threat we are going, we are under at the moment. When you start changing and destroying the environment, our people will go with it and will perish with it. So every day of our lives, we are working and fighting to have the state protect our rights. And we understand that any operation in the forest is a threat to our lives. And be it from the pandemic or businesses or climate change, all these threaten our existence and our lives. We are not, may not be prepared to uh, face the, the pace of change. Uh, Francisco, um, you have in a, already re answered the second question I was going to ask you, which is what would be the value of uh, protecting or strengthening indigenous land rights uh, in terms of helping to uh, reduce the risks of disease spreads. Um, I mean, I, I, I suppose I, I've spoken to several uh, epidemiologists recently, and they've said they're very worried that perhaps the next epidemic could come from uh, the Amazon because there's so much deforestation happening there. Um, well, you've, you've already answered my question, so uh, maybe briefly an, a different question. Um, this would be, do you think people in Brazil are starting to realize that there is a connection with between destroying nature and becoming sick? Eu creio que uma parcela bastante grande. I think that, uh, yes, a large portion of the population is now aware. Uh, the science and scientists are warning of this. There's a lot of research being done in this field. Universities and especially young researchers are uh, aware uh, and, and they feel the need to better understand the connection between forest and disease. But we are still a long way to go. We still need the Brazilian people as a whole to acknowledge the importance of the Amazon to their lives and to their survival. The survival that exists nowadays, uh, uh, this we need the, the state to do that. And but the population in general still doesn't doesn't understand because we we can see that that there is not enough power to face these crises to 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 make the state fulfill its obligations. So international pressure has uh, influenced a lot here in Brazil, for example, this this, this is what ha what's happening. Uh, the international pressure is very important for to, to help Brazilians to take the responsibility into their hands. People say that the world is meddling into Brazilian in uh, Brazilian affairs, but I think that that's not what they're doing. I think we we are globally responsible. Wherever we are, we need to be concerned about the well-being of our of the world. Just like we, uh, the Ashaninka people, we we believe that we need to work together because anything we do will have an an effect, and everybody will pay the same price for whatever it is that we do. So we understand that it is a process that needs to be strengthened because we need to defend uh, 
the environment because the way it's going in Brazil, the way things are going when it comes to the environment and indigenous peoples, the fact that we don't, that, that people just don't value our traditional knowledge, we are at risk of turning the Amazon into a problem for Brazil and a problem for the world. Because if the Amazon does not provide the environmental services that it provides nowadays, and if it disappears, the, the consequences will be dear, not only for Brazil, but for the whole world. So we are working to, to raise awareness about this. There's no other way around it. We need to have a state that is concerned. We need to have a population in Brazil that is concerned about this issue. We, are, we have such a knowledge wealth in the forest peoples, we we still need, even after many, many centuries in the forest, we still need, every day we find new things, even though we've been here for thousands of years. But can you imagine people who have never been in the forest, people who have never been there and just see uh, the, the forest through a film or just see something green and that's it. They understand that there are trees, that there's biodiversity, but it's much more than that. There is a spirituality that needs to be understood as well. So I think that we need to act and we need to respect all continent all continents, all countries with their cultural diversity, but also paying attention and being responsible for our homeland, which is our planet. Um, I think you really brought across that important point that it, people starting to understand, but not nearly enough, more international pressure is needed. Uh, clearly webinars like this on this to topic, um, I think this, you know, it's why it's so important um, and, and there needs to be a lot more. Um, so thank you very much for that. We'll, we'll now move to uh, Carlos. Uh, hi, Carlos. Um, now, you know, from, from more the, 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 the science uh, perspective and a, a sort of more global perspective, before the emergence of the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, a 2015 paper from EcoHealth Alliance suggested that land use change was the leading driver for emerging zoonosis. Can you tell us a bit more about this study? I mean, we, we kind of pre semi predicted that this might happen or something like this. Please tell us some more. Great, thank you so much for the question. I will, um, uh, I will reply in Spanish if I may. Um, no, so no. I'm gonna switch there. Um, gracias por, por, por la thank you very much for your question, yes. We are working with the topic of infectious diseases and more especially the deforestation and the land use change. The paper you're talking about, which was published in 2015, what we did was to prepare a list of all the different diseases which um, started for the first time in human populations since 1940. So for example, the first time Ebola uh, started or spilled over from an animal to human or to hu human that was the first event and that was the first time that we could find also the first time for example that um, hiv also happened in a human person from the um, primates also that's another event we are researching for each event we're trying to understand which are the factors to try to explain what happened at that particular moment something important to remember here is that and it's important to clarify really that diseases as eric rightly said zoonoses they are present um, most of them come from animals from the wildlife uh, and they come to the human life. But the key factor is the interaction between the humans and the wildlife, this interconnection, this connection. How do we 
I mean, humans interact with the wildlife, and this will determine how the appearance of these diseases is going to happen, this spillover effect. So for each case, we examine and we try to understand which are the factors underlying the appearance of Ebola, for example, when it first happened in a human being. In most cases, this is due to the fact that we have an important change in the landscape of these places, for example, deforestation. Now, deforestation can be measured in different types, like, for example, the loss of forest cover, but also to, to fragment or to just leave small patches of um, the forest, or also to have more um, um, crops of um, palm oil, for example, just the um, monoculture, and also the expansion of the agriculture area. We are feeding ourselves more, we are feeding and we are eating more as the world, and we demand more meat to consume. So the demand for meat products in Europe or in China, this is going to cause deforestation in the Amazon. So it is up to these demands which are putting the pressure in these places. And when we deforest more, there are more people working in these places, there's going to be a greater interaction between human beings and animals. And there's going to be more opportunities or more likelihood for an unknown virus to come to the human um, context. Thank you, Carlos. Um, very important the way you linked the, the, the local outbreaks and global pressures um, to, to eat into rainforests and other um, uh, biologically rich environment and create new interfaces, as Eric uh, described them, uh, where these interesting things happen that, that start to cause problems uh, for, in a much wider area. So thank you for, for elaborating on that. Um, and then the, the question that you know we're, we're, we're asking everyone, the, the fundamental question here uh, for this webinar is how can, can stronger indigenous land rights um, help to reduce these risks or manage these risks? And maybe you could also tell us a little bit more um, about the study on this subject recently by IPES, um, the it's basically the, the, the UN's collection of scientists uh, to study biodiversity. They, they looked directly at this link between biodiversity and pandemics. Um, so maybe you could tell us a little bit about that as well. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. I will keep this out in English to streamline the, <laughs> the, the, the discussion. Yes, um, in, uh, we, the IPES report on pandemics um, and, and and biodiversity and pandemics, we 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 look at what is the evidence that link uh, biodiversity and, and 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 the emergence of infectious diseases. So one of the important discussions that uh, we put there is the, the role of, uh, of indigenous territories to prevent uh, pandemics. So um, so we need to understand that uh, um, indigenous territories, most of the diversity of the world exists in this in landscapes that are traditionally owned by, by, by indigenous people and, and, and local communities. So that it's, it's, it's extremely important to understand from this part, from this, 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 this landscape, this landscape, it has a, a, the biodiversity is slowly declining, declining in these areas. So there's less uh, biodiversity loss inside this, the, the, these areas. We have preserving better biodiversity. So, but, but also these territories indigenous are suffering from the, you know, it, it, a lot of pressure around these areas for expansion of agriculture, for example. And um, so, so these areas can really preserve biodiversity for, uh, for you know, like for, for any reason that you may think, even for future generations, even for you know, genetic resources, natural resources, or just by, by, by the fact that we want to preserve biodiversity. But also there is a co another co-benefit of having territories, uh, indigenous territories, which is the maintenance of human health. So indigenous territories provide another service, which is again, maintenance of human health. For example, we've seen that deforestation is directly linked to the, the increase of malaria, especially in Brazil, and in, in, in Malaysia and in other countries that we are working on. By keeping the forest, you know, like low disturbance of forest, then 
we reduce the number of the, the cases of malaria in, the, in, the, in this region. And that has you know, benefits for the people in general, but also reduces the costs of the government that they need to invest to treat people with malaria. So this is just one example. This is just one disease. Think about other diseases that Eric mentioned before. So this, there is an accumulated um, saving uh, benefits that uh, economic benefits that they can be, and uh, we can gain for from uh, keeping uh, indigenous territories. Finally, I want to mention that we need to start thinking about indigenous territories as a as a network, not, not just an isolated area in somewhere in Brazil or somewhere in Africa or somewhere in Southeast Asia. This can really, as as a whole, can help. To, to, to protect the, the human health for, for everyone. We, we, we need to take advantage of the, the, the protected areas in general, overlap somehow with indigenous territories. I'm having this network, global network of, of well-managed uh, uh, forest can really help us to you know, save our, or help our health, our human health, but also can help the economy of each country. Gracias, Carlos. Uh, I thought that was very exciting, that last point you made um, of an, in, you know, really thinking in terms of an indigenous network, not one pace here, one piece there. I think to some degree that has started, but it's not nearly recognized enough. Um, and this year when we have big uh, COP events for climate in Glasgow, for biodiversity in Kunming, I would love it if this was discussed. Uh, more fully, because I think too often indigenous and traditional communities uh, are, are, are very wrongly seen as sort of like backward or whatever way you want to put it. They put it in, in, a, ba in a pejorative way, but this is nonsense. Uh, they, they provide, they're specialists on protecting biodiversity. <laughs> and, and it needs to be thought of in those terms. It's like super specialists who've contributed a lot to biodiversity in the forest. So thank you. I, I, I really found that very, very stimulating. Um, now, uh, our last uh, speaker, um, Gladys, um, uh, we turn to you now. Um, it would be great if you could tell us um, from the programs that you've been working on and the work that you do, what would be your recommendations for preventing zoonotic diseases in, in local and indig indigenous communities. Yeah, thank you very much for inviting me on this webinar. Um, I'll say that, you know, we championed a One Health approach as early as 2003, based on experiences I had working as a first vet for the Uganda Wildlife Authority. And the reason they had a vet actually was because they were very concerned about diseases spreading from tourists who were coming to visit um, critically endangered mountain gorillas, which at the time were only about 650 left in the world. They were concerned about a fatal flu such as COVID-19 spreading to them, and they felt they needed a veterinarian. Up to that point, everyone thought that wildlife, you know, should just be left on its own and it should be natural selection. And, but very soon when I started working, I found out that community health was very important for protecting wildlife because within nine months of my being hired, we investigated a skin disease outbreak, which turned out to be scabies in the gorillas. The baby gorilla died and the rest only recovered with treatment, but it came from people, the local communities living around the park. So the gorillas go out, went outside to eat people's banana plants because once they got habituated for tourism, they lost their fear of people. And then they went back to range where they used to range before. And, you know, Windy when it was created as a park, it used to be a forest reserve where people could cut trees. Actually, there were indigenous people living there, the Batwa community, but unfortunately, they had to be taken out in order to create the park. And they were put in settlements and they're being looked after by various NGOs, but they felt that they couldn't have them there when tourists are also entering the park. Although surprisingly, oh, they used to protect the wildlife because they had this, this uh, belief that if you look in the eyes of a gorilla, it's bad luck. But when it was created as a park, it was better to put them the government thought it was better that they stay outside so that it doesn't disrupt the activity. But a lot of the money from tourism also goes to the local communities. So when it was traced to people living around the park, we set up an NGO a few years later, Conservation Through Public Health. It's also a US registered nonprofit. 
because we felt that you can't protect the wildlife without also improving the health of the communities. So although a lot of people think of zoonotic disease as only spreading from animals to people, there's also these zoonotic diseases that spread from people to animals. And that was our, has been our main focus. But one thing that we've also realized that why did they get, why do we have such zoonotic diseases? You know, they also have a high prevalence of tuberculosis. They also have, you know, because they have poor hygiene and sanitation. So they're more likely to get all kinds of infectious diseases. And they also eat bushmeat. And bushmeat has, you know, there have been Ebola outbreaks in Central Africa, gorillas that have died of Ebola or chimpanzees, people who ate them died of Ebola. So disease goes in both directions. And one thing that we do at CTPH is on top of look, preventing diseases by looking at comparative pathogen analysis between people, wildlife and livestock, we also very much focus on behavior change communication where we basically work with the local communities and from them, we select community health workers. It's done transparently with their local leaders. And these community health workers are trained to do conservation work. So as they tell people not to, you know, to be healthy and hygienic, um, not to poach, because poaching also results in picking up diseases from wildlife. They told them not to cut down trees, protect the forest, it's an important water source. When you protect it, you're also more likely, less likely to get diseases. So the whole, it's a whole package which goes towards them. And because it comes from people within their community, it's not imposed from someone elsewhere, from, you know, from within Uganda or from another country, they're more likely to change. And we've seen a lot of behavior change. And I believe that the way forward is by putting communities at the forefront of changing and making their lives better, not imposing from elsewhere, but having a bottom up approach. And through it, we even had the Batwa, because it's, we mainly have around windy forests where the mountain gorillas are found, mainly by Bachiga, but the Batwa who are evicted from the forest, they have village health and conservation teams among them, basically community health workers doing conservation work as well. They basically are changing the communities in their settlements. And one great thing that has come out of the pandemic is that because they're worried about getting COVID, which is, has been a focus of our work when the pandemic began, getting stopping people from getting COVID through improving hygiene, mask wearing and social distancing. The, hand, the number of hand washing facilities has gone up outside people's homes. So I, I really believe that behavior change communication is a very good way of getting indigenous communities to prevent zoonotic disease transmission. Thank you, Gladys. Uh, really interesting points. Um, there were many struck out, but among them were this idea that this transmission is a two way street and we can harm nature as well as nature or oh, non human nature as well as human nature. Uh, that was important. And uh, uh, this idea that you don't tr just train community activists to be conservationists or health workers, that the two jobs are in a way combined. Um, and it, it's important to see those two things together and the health of nature and the health of humans is interlinked. I, I think that's very strong. Um, uh, the, the, the question, again, going back to the question we're asking everyone, um, do you think, you know, in the areas where you work, that this pandemic has helped people understand that um, protecting uh, indigenous and local land is it is, is helpful to protect biodiversity and as a result can help to reduce risks of, uh, of, of disease outbreaks. Is, is, that, is that happening? Um, I believe it's happening a lot more. People are realizing the big link between you know, protecting biodiversity and, and reducing the level of emerging infectious diseases. It's being understood a lot more because everyone used to think it's not linked. But actually when the pandemic began, people who used to wonder why we are combining the two came and said, now we understand what you've been doing all along. And this was not only at the community level, but also at the government level and the donor community as well. And I think that even within where we live in Uganda, East Africa, people are beginning to realize that we have to protect nature in order to save ourselves. And, you know, a lot of it is like, you have to really support the local communities, you know, make sure that when they have agriculture on their land, it's sustainable, because that's what they used to do before these, for, these protected areas were set up. They used to do things sustainably. They used to live with the wildlife sustainably. But now it's a matter of getting them back to doing things in a sustainable way. They don't over harvest from the forest. They don't, 
they protect their land, they use proper soil and water agriculture, and go back to some of the things that they used to do before, which they had kind of given up on. I mean, we even work with traditional healers in the communities to get them to, you know, recognize people who are ill, take them to refer them to the health centers, but also to continue to protect what they have. The forest is a good resource of medicinal plants, but the more that you destroy it, they no longer have these medicinal plants and they're not even able to plant them elsewhere because everything is changing, the whole climate and the ecosystem is changing. So it's a matter of working with all the existing cultural leaders or cultural systems that were in place and building upon them to, to really protect the wildlife. Some of our cultures, you know, I, for example, come from the lion clan and I'm not in my clan, you're not allowed to kill or touch a lion because it's a big taboo. And everybody has a different plant that they're, oh, whether it's an elephant or a particular plant. My mom is from a certain plant. And the way that it works is that there's always gonna be a group of people that protects a certain species of animal or plants within our culture. And so all these things, people are realizing that if you want to avoid future pandemics, you have to start, go back to preserving culture and preserving nature and preserving you know, the rights of people who are living in certain places. So yeah, I mean, in a way the pandemic, the silver lining to the pandemic has been that we need to be much more careful about conserving nature and looking at it as a way as keep, of keeping us all healthy. Thank you, Gladys. Um, thank you all for, for these, these comments. And um, we, we are now moving on to question and answer a little bit later than planned, but have a fair bit of time. Uh, we already have quite a bunch of questions, but feel free to add to them. Uh, don't forget at the question and answer button at the bottom of the screen. Um, let's start. Um, thank you to my colleagues who filtered some of these questions for me. Um, there is, okay, the, the top question, for, it's addressed to Eric and Carlos. So this question, the researchers have successfully trained communities in DRC to use technology to monitor and report signs of Ebola. Ebola before spillover occurs. And IPES experts worked with indigenous hunters to assess extinction risk. So the question is, what role do you see for local communities as partners in protecting human and planetary health? So very much building on, on what Gladys has just told us, um, but Eric and Carlos from, from this, uh, uh sort of bigger global perspective um what's what are your thoughts on that um okay you said my name first i'll start and then hand to, to carlos um it it's essential I, I think any any health system that is divorced from the people it's supposed to serve uh won't function very well and so uh in in the context of of those kinds of interface environments working with people who, who live and use those environments is, is really important. We've heard uh, Gladys's examples. Sometimes it may simply be around surveillance and sometimes technology can help with that, um, reporting systems and so on. But, but otherwise ensuring that, uh, that there is a means by which the people at those interfaces have a voice to speak of the things that are going on there um, and, and, and report that through the system where it needs to be heard so that appropriate actions or preventative, uh, preventative actions can be, can be taken. So I don't think we can divorce the actions that need to be taken at those interfaces from the people who live at them. The, the two are completely intertwined. Carlos. Yeah, that's a good question. And actually there are, I'm absolutely, I think that the, the, the indigenous people and Latin communities can Play an important role in surveillance systems. And there's been some interesting examples. For example, in Bolivia a few years ago, there's a, 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 as part of a project that I was working with, there's a, a local community living very close to a protected area. They, they were working with us and they observed a, a different, like a bunch of um, a, a monkeys that, uh, holler monkeys that were dead. And immediately, one of the teams they examined these, these, uh, these animals and they, they found that these animals were. You know, they, 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 they had um, Two, three, yellow yeah, fever. Yeah. So we, uh, so there was a response, a response by the, by the, by the ah, plantas, sim, to to prevent prevent a, a pandemic, pandemic in, 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 yellow, yellow fever in, in humans in that area. 
it's possible to, to do that. And there are systems, for example, in Thailand, there are a few systems you can uh, see. If you see a dead animal, they take pictures and then they, they send it to a center, uh, you know, like a, where there are like veterinarians, they can assess immediately if these animals are, you know, what are they diagnosed over this because they are far away areas and then they can help even potentially prevent a, a, a local outbreaks. This is developed for, for domestic animals, but then can be easily expanded to other, you know, monitoring other, other wildlife. Thank you. Um, the, uh, the next question that this is for all of you, but um, maybe as Eric and Carlos have already spoken on the first one, we could focus on uh, uh, Gladys, Georgie and Francisco for this one, but later uh, Eric and Carlos happy to chip in if you wish to. Um, so this question is, how would you see the global north uh, and Western countries, wealthier countries, making up for decades of colonizing and resource extraction that have resulted in the mass deaths of indigenous communities uh, and resulted in environmental and infectious disease ramifications that we see now. Um, so basically, I suppose this is a question of uh, responsibility, it's a question of um, uh, inequality and how to address that um, and yeah who, you know some of some of the things might have costs who should be paying um, if any of you um, uh, Francisco or Georgie Gladys whichever of you would like to start just jump in um, I'll, I'll come first um, I think uh, everyone is so interconnected uh, today. And as you yourself uh, mentioned, a lot of the um, very destructive uh, policies, uh, money or uh, law actually emanates from these powerful governments in the North, right? And also the overconsumption of uh, goods are also emanating from the north right so um acting on uh, structural changes in uh, your own countries and societies will actually be very important in um lifting the pressures away from um uh for example indigenous peoples because uh, indigenous peoples are in a way are survivors <laughs> we have navigated uh, at how to address these problems, but a lot of them emanate from um, unequal wealth, unequal loss, and even a lack of understanding that uh, modern societies have actually much to learn from indigenous peoples, and that uh, these impositions of knowledge from uh, coming from the north um, needs to be addressed in uh, in our own minds and in everyone's own uh, practice and behavior. Thank you, Georgie. Um, Francisco or Gladys, would you like to address that? Um, uh, Francisco. Uh, creo que... I believe that countries such as Brazil uh, could act in a smarter way. When we think of, uh, of our political leaders, they could act in a smarter way. We have seen many countries from the developed world already discovering, already identifying harmful practices from the past, especially in this stage of development, Brazil cannot afford to go blind, to, to play the blind man and pretend that it is not seeing all these problems that have already been identified by other countries. We cannot ignore the experience from other countries. I think we need to 
acompanhar um pouco o debate. We need to do... follow the global debate. Because we can find in the global debate that there are many questions. There are many, uh, there are many issues that have been proved to be wrong. I mean, we can correct wrongs from the past. Because even though there is uh, that that things have reached a, a certain level, there are things still to be done so that we can have a population that can fully solve their problems. But I think that first world countries face many problems still. But there are things that things that can help us not to make the same mistakes so that we do not repeat the same mistakes that were made by developed countries in the beginning of their development. Another point that I think it's important to mention is that even developed countries can uh, still receive products that are produced in, in developing countries such as Brazil that are actually illegally uh, obtained, that are the result of deforestation and, and, and the like. Products that do not obey the environmental legislation. And we still have a large market of Brazilian products that are illegal, that do not respect the current environmental law and also do not respect the indigenous people's rights and these products are in the market so i think that it's possible to work in a way that would start hindering this market Thank this would be something that i think that we could use as a strategy Thank because you cannot you cannot say Brazil don't do this but you buy products from Brazil that are illegal so it doesn't make sense thank you Francisco very important um, yes that connection between what what's happening here um, well me in the in a consumer nation uh, and what's happening there um, Gladys did you want to uh, uh, address this too yes um, just to add on to what Francisco has just been said regarding consumption of products responsible consumption. It's very possible for people from the, the global north to really support the global south. For example, during the pandemic, it's been widely seen that tourists, because of the lockdowns all over the world, people have not been able to travel to these places where they can spend money at wherever they find, you know, the wildlife and the people. But if there are ways that you can export these products abroad, and for example, if someone's buying coffee or tea, They'd rather buy tea or coffee that's been, you know, bought at a fair price and is helping smallholder farmers and is helping not to destroy the environment. And, and I would just like to give an example of uh, we have like, we started a social enterprise called Gorilla Conservation Coffee, where the farmers around Brindy Forest, we found that they were not benefiting from tourism directly. So where we decided to give them a better mark price for their good coffee, which is then sold all over the world, but it was mainly being sold in Uganda until the pandemic occurred. And then we started to look for markets elsewhere like the UK or the US and New Zealand. And in this way, then they don't have to enter the forest to port to survive because they're getting money. And other people in the community are now trying to sell their crafts abroad. So responsible consumption is one very good way of support of the global north, supporting the global north <laughs> to keep things going and help to protect nature. At the same time, I think it's very important for the global north to really recognize that it's, it's much more sustainable to train people and build the capacity of local groups in the global south, rather than only bringing in you know, experts from abroad to do all the work that people locally should be learning to do for themselves. Um, because this then enables a long, long-term capacity building and ownership of the solutions and helping things to be in the long term to get the countries in the global south, you know, to come from being underdeveloped to improve, you know, to reduce poverty in these countries and raise their standards of living on a long term, 
the global north can help with training and things like that but if they start implementing the work that people are supposed to be doing for themselves to get themselves out of poverty or you know get themselves out of destroying their own habitats then it basically you just keep on perpetuating this cycle that keeps going on for decades and decades so i think that's something that donors and you know need to find better ways of supporting biodiversity and health in such situations thank you very much gladys um the next question um going back to uh, eric and carlos um there's a few on this on this line but they basically all say well, along the lines of if one health had been properly implemented 10 five years ago how could it have made a difference in this covid crisis to make the the epidemic less severe um uh, uh, whoever wants to jump in first um okay i'll carlos i'm happy to see the floor to you unless you want me to start um go ahead, Eric. Go ahead. okay so um, one health is not a new concept and um organizations individual scientists uh, the public have been working or thinking in a one health context to some extent uh, already for many years and and that's helped us understand the interconnectivity between ecosystems between hosts and reservoirs and so on and and as others have rightly said the fact that something like covid was likely to occur at some point uh, is wasn't a surprise to those who'd who'd sat down to to consider it and there, there are lots of lots of places lots of areas where which we haven't really discussed very much where the one health concept is also very relevant in, in terms of food systems for example and the connectivity of farm to urban populations who might consume food and, and so on so with but with respect to the to the question um it the, the fact that an event such as the jump of a virus into the human population would occur. We knew that was happening. We were sort of ready, but we weren't doing enough surveillance in order to catch where and when that might actually happen. And so I don't think we can blame One Health on that. What we, what we, can, what we need to say is that the, the approach and then the response to the, the occurrence of that event wasn't particularly well handled and it dragged on too long and it, it was allowed really to become a, an outbreak, an epidemic and then a global pandemic. So I'm not sure One Health could have prevented that from happening, but certainly it can, it, it can, One, One Health can help us understand that that is likely to happen and then we need to work with people who are responsible for uh, surveillance policy effectively to, to put in place stronger surveillance so that we can detect when that happens and that we can respond to it more quickly. Thank you, Eric. No, I didn't mean to suggest, and I don't, I don't think the questions mean to suggest that One Health is responsible in any way. I suppose the question is, if you could implement it more thoroughly and more countries took it more seriously and put more resources into it, how could it have helped? And I think you did address that, um, thank you. And, and Carlos, if you could uh, also tackle that. No, I completely agree with Eric. It's it's a matter of of, of, of resource mobilization to these type of uh, approaches. Uh, another example, interesting example, is the Ebola outbreak uh, a few years ago in in in, in Liberia and, and Sierra Leone. And there's some, you know, like in 2014, so it's, it's hundreds of uh, thousands of people got infected with with Ebola. And after learning about this, you know, horrific problem. The uh, Liberia government implemented a one health uh, approach uh, that is embedded in the government now. So they learn by you know by by living through this uh, extreme uh, problem, and they 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 now have this implemented in the government. So now uh, every other week, I, I believe it's the, there's reports from not just from from the public health component, but also from the environmental uh, uh, sector but also for the human and the, the animal sector. So they, everybody's working together. They learn from this, uh, from this problem and they now implement it. There are new initiatives, similar, similar initiatives in other countries. I believe Cote d'Ivoire also, I think implemented something like that. 
And the great thing about this is that more people are learning and, and understanding this problem, and they're trying to implement a One Health uh, approach into their you know, legislation, into their government. So it's a lesson learned, but now we need to start mobilizing resources and training more people on this topic. Thank you, Carlos. Um, you remind me of an interview I had um, last year with Roger Frutos, um, who's a specialist in infectious diseases at the University of Montpellier. And he also um, predicted um, that, that, that a huge pandemic would happen. And he said to prevent this in the future, he told me um, we need a massive international cooperation and investment to encourage monitoring and education at a local level. Um, so yes, protection of land rights is important, but also investment at a local level in, in, in building up um, surveillance systems and then responding so you catch things early. Um, and again, I, you know, of course that will cost a lot of money, but look, at if you don't do it, uh, how, how much we've all paid. Um, I, I'd love to get in, um, if we went a little bit further and everybody kept their answers very short, um, I'd like to put the last question to you. And if you could just keep it to two or three sentences, your answer, I think will will not be too late. Um, but it will be this question for all of you. Looking forward, this is an epic year with a COVID, with a COP for the climate. It's an epic year with a, uh, co a COP for biodiversity and lots of other reasons. If you could do one thing to sort of promote this idea of indigenous help uh, for to prevent pandemics, support for indigenous land rights, at that level, if you could send one message to those uh, policymakers, um, what might it be? Um, and again, please do keep it brief because we're actually at the end of our time, but it will almost be like your, your final headline that you, you leave with. Uh, so maybe we could start with uh, Georgie. Sorry to put this on you. Um, thanks, Jonathan. So um, the governments are now negotiating a new biodiversity strategy, which is supposed to be adopted. And the message we're sending them is that if you want to succeed in conservation, in sustainable use, and um, protection of ecosystem species and uh, genetic diversity, uh, really respect the rights of indigenous peoples and uh, put that in our strategy. Thank you, Georgie. To the point and very precise. Um, next, um, Eric, if you don't mind. Yes, so the, the scientific community has been saying a lot of what I and others have been saying today uh, for a long time. And what, what I would say to those groupings of people is that ministers of finance need to now listen and need to allocate the resources necessary for a lot of what we know works to be put into action. And if, if, if the finances aren't available at national level, at international level, and at, at the very local level too, then we can keep talking, but things will never really change. So we need that financing and that, that is demonstrative of, of uh, commitment. Totally agree, which is why I emphasized at the beginning, look at the costs if you don't do it, we could have that again. And so let's find that money. Uh, Gladys, please. Yeah, um, I would say that just echoing what, what everybody's saying, it's very important for, yes, Minister of Finance to put more resources into both human and animal health care, because we often find actually that when you have diseases, there's much more resources going into human health than animal health when you have disease outbreaks. And then once you've dealt with case management, the source of the disease outbreak remains because there's not enough resources to prevent it or to do enough ecological monitoring. And so government should put more resources in healthcare in general, and also to support communities to, you know, to improve on their livelihoods. And I think that's very important. Thank you. Thanks, Gladys. Uh, Francisco, please. I believe, I believe that, that in terms of public policy, in, in the case of Brazil, we have made huge advancements. 
but now this legislation needs to be enforced, come out of paper and become real, tangible. For example, our environmental act, which protects the forests and our communities. This legislation has been established in the past, but nowadays we see the contrary movement going against the, our past conquests. So this care for the environment has to be embedded in our souls. We need to take care of the precious knowledge of, from indigenous people and the peoples from the forest. Thank you, uh, Francisco. Embedded in our souls. What a fantastic message. Um, and finally, Carlos, please. Yeah, thank you. So two things. I think it's important to, to, to recognize that the rights of indigenous people is, uh, and, and securing rights for indigenous people is essential, it's, it's cost effective. So we need to start talking with policymakers in economic terms, so because that's what they, they, that's the language they understand. And second, that we need to make sure that indigenous people and local communities participate in the negotiations at all these high events that we are discussing. Usually those people are not represented uh, for the, you know, by, by their authorities. And we need to make sure they are there speaking, raising their voice. Thank you, Carlos. Um, thank you all. I think we've had some amazing discussions today, some really strong, bright ideas, indigenous networks across much stronger than we even have now. Uh, the, the, the need to focus at a community level, um, to, to link human health, animal health, nat nature health, uh, the idea of embedding um, nature protection in our souls. I mean, all wonderful, wonderful messages. Uh, and also reinforcing that this, this is, and it makes economic sense. It, this isn't a cost. Doing nothing is the cost. Um, I think that, you know, this has been fabulous for all of those reasons. So thank you to our panel. Thank you again to our host, the Ford Foundation, the Land Portal Foundation, the Tenure Facility, and Thomson Reuters Foundation. Thank you to the translators, Luciana, Cynthia, Maria, Sarah, Sandrini, and Natalia. Um, thank you to all of you in the audience for watching and staying with us. Sorry we couldn't use all of your questions, but I hope it was as enjoyable and as intellectually stimulating for you as it was for me. Um, Please, uh, there will be a, a survey. You can see a link. There will be a survey about this um, that I hope you can uh, fill in. Um, this, don't forget this recording will be available um, in a few days. So it can be a very useful resource. And please look out for the next uh, episode of this Land Dialogue webinar, webinar series. Uh, remember there's one a month. Um, and with that, I will uh, say thank you all and goodbye. I wish you a wonderful rest of your day, wherever you are.